Hey guys, so this is going to be the behind the scenes video for Feathers of Fortune, which is my 2023 short film. I know it's coming out uh, several months late in the middle of 2024, but we're going to be kind of rehashing what we did the previous year with Thrifted Hoodies. So Thrifted Hoodies, we had this long behind the scenes super vlog that I called it. Well, we're back for another one. So we're going to be starting off with a pre-production. So we're going to be going through what I used to write the script and the storyboard. And then we're going to talk about kind of what I, what was going through my mind when I was writing that script in the first place. Um, and then we're going to get into production, different problems that I ran into and how I tackled them. And then finally, we're going to be going through post-production, which is going to be like editing, VFX, audio, color, uh, my whole pipeline for that and all the stuff that I learned along the way. So enjoy the ride. I've put uh, chapter markers in the bottom so you can just skip to the sections that you are most interested in. And let's uh, kick it off from here with pre-production tools. So maybe four months ago, I was on a flight to Europe and I was thinking like, hey, you know, I don't really want to pay for Wi-Fi. So maybe I should just like write out the screenplay and that'll be my short film for the year 2023. And I wrote out most of the screenplay and I've since made a lot of modifications to dialogue, to different setups and, and the scenes and so on. And let's go ahead and dive into that here. So I wrote the screenplay back in July and made, you know, maybe three or four different versions of it since then, three or four different drafts. And what I like to do for writing screenplays is I just write it in LaTeX here. So I use the good old document class screenplay. And then you can just write it out like in code and then it renders to a nice PDF as we have on the right. After I've written the whole screenplay, what I'll do is I'll make a shot list. So this here is my shot list and you can kind of see the rendered version on the right. And for the shot list, what I do is I think about the short film. I, I go through all of the scenes that we have and I want to figure out what shots are going to be necessary. Um, one thing I've done here is I made ASCII art diagrams of all the different kinds of locations and setups so that I can kind of keep track of where each camera, which I've labeled like C1 through uh, C4 here, or in this case, C0 through C4. And I can kind of think like, okay, what are all the different angles that'll be needed in order to tell the story that's in a given scene? So I've done that for all the scenes going through the short film, including the flashbacks and all these different things. And then the next step is going to be to draw out a storyboard. With most of my previous short films, I actually did this in the other order. So I'd write the screenplay and then I would draw out the storyboard for every single shot. And obviously, like if you're cutting dialogue, you're going to be cutting from person A to person B, and you might be recycling those angles several times. So this actually required quite a lot of drawing. And then after I had drawn out the whole thing and had an idea of how that would flow, I would go ahead and write the shot list. So then when it came to the shoot day, I would know, OK, here are the 12 shots that are needed for this sequence, for example. So this time I'm deciding to do the opposite. I decided to write the shot list first so that when I do the storyboard, I can just draw only the shots that I think are going to be necessary. And then hopefully they'll save me some time during the storyboarding process. One thing that I've done differently for uh, this short film is that I've purchased a uh, really cheap Wacom tablet here that goes with a pen and then I can draw it directly on my computer. What this lets me do is I can do my storyboarding digitally and then I can cut it together and then actually see what the timing is going to be like and how it's going to flow. And this is the first time I've done that. And I'm really hoping that it's going to be helpful for me. Future Thatcher here. It did end up being helpful to have the overall uh, animatic uh, during production because then I could really see if there were shots that I wanted to cut out, would it still flow? And I could make sure that everything was going to work out. Back to the past. Just to give you guys an example, um, I've already done it for all of scene one. And if we take scene two, it's going to start up with a close up of Bianca showing that she's wearing her chicken costume. We've just cut away from the end of scene one in which she looks like shocked. She's wondering like, gee, am I going to make this decision? And then we do the payoff. There she is in the chicken costume, right? My drawing program of choice here happens to be Fusion Studio. I probably wouldn't recommend this for everyone. But if we're on the first shot of, say, scene two, what I'll do is I'll simply draw her out. And by the way, I'm not like an illustrator or anything. So my drawings are pretty basic. Um, a lot of people do stick figure drawings. I have my style in which I draw their head and kind of show how big it's going to look. Um, I'm going to draw B on her forehead to indicate that it's Bianca. And uh, there we go. That's some style with the hair. And then that's her. And that's pretty much all we have to do for this specific shot. We can go ahead and repeat that with all the following shots. So the next shot will be a shot of the restaurant. Um, 
So the restaurant is this like large building like this. So number five on it. And then we'll pan down uh, downwards this way and there will be Sean and Sean's chilling there uh, waiting in line at the door. You know, So it's not like the most intensive kind of storyboard. You know, Bianca can come over here and uh, she comes into frame probably, let's say this way, and meets up with Sean. We'll see if it looks like that in the final piece, but I'm keeping this storyboard like this. So after I've rendered out all the still frames from my storyboard, here's an example of what I've got from uh, scene one. So I've got, I've drawn out every single shot and it's super ugly. Um, here are a couple like shot layout diagrams. Okay, so after I've drawn out all the different shots for a given scene, I will pull them into DaVinci Resolve and cut it together as like a little animatic so that I can kind of see how everything is going to be timed. And on top of this, I've subtitled each of the different lines of dialogue that are in the short film, which I simply did by just copying and pasting these from my screenplay. So then we can watch through it. We can kind of see how this plays out. It starts off with tarot cards. Alice is sitting there. Bianca walks behind her. Bianca approaches the door, you know, and then they have their different lines of dialogue. Right now I can see it's probably cut a little fast, to be honest, so I'll probably expand it out. And hopefully, if I do this for the whole short film, then I'll have a good idea of how long everything's going to run. I'll have an idea of if I forgot shots for my shot list and so on. So far, this has been pretty helpful. I definitely noticed that I missed a few shots and I made sure that things are going to be easy to follow and uh, sort of the layout of people in the room and so on are going to be... Uh, easy to understand for the audience. So in addition, in pre-production, I had to do a couple other tasks. So the first one was identifying locations. The most difficult location for this short film was going to be the restaurant that's gonna be in the second scene because I personally don't have any friends in the restaurant business. So I asked my friend Lomo, who runs an event planning company, to identify restaurants that were closed on the weekends and had like a good vibe and a window and things like that so that we could get good lighting in there. And then we emailed and called up all these different restaurants and tried to figure out which ones were open, how much their rates were, and so on, so that we could book one of these restaurants during the day on like a Saturday or a Sunday. She was really great at that. So if you need to plan an event in the Bay Area, I've left a link to her business below and you can contact her. The other technical thing that I had to do was camera testing. So for this short film, I'm shooting on the Zcam E2, which is a 4K camera with a Micro Four Thirds sensor. And over the last few weeks, I've profiled the camera. So it fits into my color management, which will help me when I'm color grading in post. And thanks to the color management, I can create a good monitoring LUT. So I did a few different exposures and try to figure out what ISO I need to rate the camera at, you know, meaning what should I expose for in order to get a reasonably clean image with sufficient dynamic range that I'm not going to be clipping my highlights left and right. The ZKM E2 does not have the most dynamic range. It's probably got like 11 stops, but I think we can make it work. I've also gone ahead and scheduled certain rentals. So I'm renting a drape system and like a bunch of chairs for the third scene. And I've also had to source a bunch of uh, chicken costumes, mostly on Amazon. Really, that's just scrolling through Amazon and finding four funny costumes. Now, before we get into the next section, what I wanna do is I'm gonna play the animatic in the background and it'll be side by side with the uh, finished short film. So you can kind of see how that turned out. In the meantime, Instead of telling you about our sponsor, which we don't have, I'm going to be telling you about sort of the main bullet points that were relevant to me when I was kind of writing the script. These were the things that I was trying to focus on that, you know, I like you, you can judge for yourself whether or not I really executed them well. But I think these are things that are useful to focus on for anyone who is making a short film of their own. So I think the easiest thing to do in a short to really like add emotional impact is to have this kind of like callback at the end or like this kind of book ending structure. So we wrap up all the loose ends and then we have this ending that kind of uh, really gives some kind of closure. So uh, closing up the loose ends, you know, we had that character, uh, I call him Greg in the short. Um, he's the guy with the uh, inflatable costume who ends up shooting the mayor or at least trying to. We use him to kind of explain this, uh, this whole snafu with the restaurant reservation. And, you know, we call back to this bulletproof chicken suit idea that we introduced at the beginning. And by providing that kind of like memory to the viewer, it kind of creates a very satisfying sort of feeling, assuming they remember it. The second thing I tried to do in the screenplay was to kind of 
write all the dialogue in a way that there's some amount of tension or some amount of stakes to the words that were being said. So in the first scene, Tiffany is kind of uh, in disaster mode in that she's made a horrible decision prior to, you know, the short taking place. And she needs to make sure that she doesn't end up getting fired and whatnot. So we like kind of introduce this problem and then we try to figure out how are we going to address it. In the second scene, we start off with uh, her not having the necessary reservation. And then later, Sean kind of discovers that she uh, likely doesn't have a reservation or perhaps is lying about it. And that kind of like creates some amount of interest when you're watching those scenes and hopefully makes them a little less boring. I also try to introduce a, a couple comedic elements so that there's some variety in the emotional tone. The third thing that I really wanted to focus on was maximizing the usage of the concept, right? So this whole short is about a girl, you know, wearing a costume to a date. But if we just had her do normal date activities, then really this costume thing would be almost irrelevant. So the important thing was to uh, make sure that there's some kind of activity or some scene that happens in the movie that could only happen if she was wearing some kind of outrageous costume. For this date right like we, we try to set it up so that if you removed this costume idea you couldn't just replace it with some other like cosmetic adjustment and have the same short that way the the whole concept feels really integrated with the short film and when someone says like oh yeah you know it's about you know a girl wearing a chicken costume right like that's actually like a critical part of the description it's rather than girl goes on a date and it starts out as a disaster um the other kind of thing we have in here is we have this like idea of this psychic powers of like Tiffany's roommate in the in the movie Emily. And I just wanted to make sure that we were, we had this kind of consistency where the tarot cards are generally correct and that it turns out the psychic is just spitting out facts. Now, I personally don't believe in psychics, but sometimes it makes a funny concept in a short film if it doesn't rely too heavily on that concept. And finally, the fourth thing that I wanted to do in this short was to have some kind of character development. And I think this is honestly one of the most important things. This and the first one with the uh, book ending. So I think the most obvious form of development in this short is this idea where like Sean and Tiffany's characters uh, learn not to be afraid of this chicken costume. Like they, they both start out very reserved about the idea. And at the end, they've fully committed to it that everyone's in a chicken costume by the uh, second date. I also wanted to have some more uh, kind of like subtle adjustments. So for example, Sean learns to find Tiffany attractive, like particularly after she makes a decision that for once is not just like a in the moment, like greedy judgment. You know, she does something that's kind of selfless, which is that she saves the mayor. But some of these character developments are a little bit subtle because I didn't really like hammer it in as hard uh, in the short run time. So you have to make sure that you have one kind of like obvious, like overarching character development from the start to the end. Now, if the animatic isn't uh, done right now, we're just going to move on to the next section, but I'll uh, post an unlisted video with the animatic versus like the short film comparison in the description. Next up, I'll walk through production and we can go through the ups and downs of shooting this short. So we started off with scene one, uh, which we just shot in my apartment. So this was a pretty smooth sailing scene with only two different locations. Um, let's cut to the tapes and we can see how I lit it. Hey guys, we're about to start shooting on Feathers of Fortune. Uh, let me show you guys the setup for the first shot. Here I've got the camera and it's going to be pointed right over here at our table with our couple candles and our uh, vases. Behind it, I've got a rim light up here that's hiding in the corner within the kitchen. We've got another light outside that's going to be pointed bouncing off of the ceiling in here in order to light the entire room. We've got Emily playing Alice featuring Tiffany playing Bianca and Mel on sound. All right, here's the second half of the first scene in which we're now in uh, Alice's room. So I'll show you guys what that looks like here. So what we have here are two lights outside pointed through windows as one does. So we've got two lights out there. Next up, we have we have dimmable uh, tungsten balance lights up here. I'm just using them practically, but I made sure to get them dimmable so that we can uh, control how much of each light there is. So a week after shooting scene one, we ended up shooting scene three. And we decided to shoot these out of order because of the availability of each of the actors. I scheduled it for October 22nd, and somehow I picked the only day of the month that ended up having a weather forecast that said it was going to rain. So. This was really suboptimal, but it actually wasn't the only problem we ran into that day. 
Hey guys, so it's October 22nd and we're about to shoot uh, scene three of Feathers of Fortune. Um, I'm here on our set, which is just like Willow Glen Park. And right now you, we can see that my drapes are uh, on the ground because the event rental company sent me base plates with the wrong spigot size oh. that are too small for the drapes. So we're gonna have to find some other way to, uh, to hack this thing together so that it stands up, probably propping it up against this tree. And the other thing that I want to highlight so take a look at this weather forecast here. We're going to be shooting from 11 to maybe 6 p.m. And we can see different percentage chances of rain. However, for each one, if we click into it, it says rain amount zero inches, right? <laughs> so, you know, how am I supposed to interpret 38% chance of zero rain? So hopefully, I would expect that by like starting shooting early, we'll be okay and hopefully not have problems. But I don't know. So luckily we managed to just like tape together the poles to the to the bases and load them up with stand bags, lean them against the tree and get it all kind of standing up working okay. One thing I was thinking about when choosing this location was to pick part of the park where it was already brown and you know the season was only going to get browner after this point in time. So if we did end up having to cancel the shoot, we'd be able to just like come back and reshoot at another time and it would probably look roughly the same. Additionally, I hedged that if it did rain, I wanted all the stuff to be kind of underneath trees so that our actors and equipment wouldn't get too wet. These choices ended up paying off because at 2 or 3 p.m. it did end up raining pretty hard and we all had umbrellas and just waited underneath the trees for a little bit. And also this got rid of all the kids playing baseball at the same time, which was like kind of messing with the audio. Next up is scene two, which we shot at number five kitchen. This was kind of convenient because the restaurant was just closed on one of the weekends. So we were able to just ask the owner to like let us in and we could shoot inside the restaurant. One thing that's kind of funny is that we only had four extras who could make it. So I just like put them in the background of each shot. And if you pay attention, you can see that there really are only four other people in the restaurant and they're just like moving around uh, from shot to shot. My lighting strategy was to put my light on a, a boom pole behind each character. And that would kind of serve as like an interior, like kind of hair light, like as if there's just tungsten lights around in the restaurant, which, you know, there were some but they definitely weren't that close to the entrance or really like uh, visible in any of the shots. My tungsten light was just a daylight colored LED, which I had a CTO gel on it to color it a bit more orange. But when I bought this boom pole that uh, held the light, the boom arm I got was only like three or four feet long. So I ended up having to put it in some of the shots and I just made sure I put it in locations that would be easy for me to uh, paint out and post. That turned out to be a pain in the butt, but we did something similar in first message. So, you know, I knew that I could do it. So the last scene of the short was at the beach and we kind of just showed up like at four or 5 p.m. And we just shot during like blue hour. The sun was kind of going in and out of clouds. And in this very last shot, you know, we had to like move all of our equipment from the beach up onto the, uh, the cliff that was next to it. And the sun had already like kind of started to set so that was all blue hour and you know the shot was going really blue and we had to fix that in the color grade a little bit and then after that it was just really small amounts of photography so uh, I met up with with John for one of the flashback scenes uh, this flashback scene was actually shot like in the middle of the night it was like probably 8 or 9 p.m. and I just pointed a light through the window and recorded the one line and that was it Let's get into the edit. So there were four things that I wanted to cover that were maybe unique or interesting about my edit in this project. So let's start off with the, the first trick that I used. So this was something that I did a few times in first message. And I think I also used it in uh, thrifted hoodies a little bit, but it's this technique of having a split frame performances. So we're gonna take the performance on the left side from one clip and the performance on the right side from a different clip and then we're gonna to try to splice these together. Sorry about the screen recording, my computer's not very fast, so I don't want to run the color grade and the screen recording at the same time, so we're just gonna be looking at the log images. So the idea here is that compared to the original clip, which we maybe had down here, this is the one that has Sean's performance. Sure. This is sure. And then towards the end of the clip, Tiffany walks away a little bit early so she can go enter the restaurant. However, I wanted her to kind of stay here for a little bit so that it wouldn't be distracting when she leaves. So during the edit process, I sloppily spliced together this split frame from, uh, I think I just shifted the clip to the left a little bit. So 
So now we've uh, kind of retimed her performance. We've stolen her performance from half a second earlier. Sure. And then uh, we kind of just cropped off the right half of the frame here, as you can see. So then together, it looks like this. Sure. And now she's kind of just staying there for, for a bit longer. And then what I had to do is I had to go back in VFX and actually clean up the seam and track it so that this half of the frame is uh, moves in sync with the left half of the frame here. So that's a little trick there in order to get a bit more performance out of it. The other notable time that I did something similar was here we had the performance of Sean. Hi guys. So she's just said, I decided to wing it. Sean chuckles, right? And originally there's too much time between this chuckle and when uh, Jen over here shows up on the left. So what I did is I did a morph cut uh, on Sean's face here so that we could trim it down a bunch. But by doing this morph cut, you can see that there are like artifacts on Tiffany on the right. See like this, this kind of like fade like makes no sense, right? So what I did is I then took on the performance of Tiffany uh, from the after part of the clip. And here I've kind of just like cropped in the right half here. And then later in VFX, I stitch it all together so that there's no slippage um, as the camera kind of pans during this, during this cut. So you can see now it kind of sticks together pretty well. And we're able to kind of maintain Tiffany's performance, but modify Sean's using the morph cut uh, in order to speed up this, uh, this segment. Another editing trick that I used here was to have this recurring theme of the tarot cards. And I use these tarot cards uh, in this particular case because like I did have some shots of Sean and Tiffany walk towards the restaurant. However, when I shot the segment, it was actually after the rest of the photography. So I told all the extras to go home. And as a result, the restaurant's very empty and kind of dark. So I could not allow us to pan from this angle over to the right towards the door of the restaurant. And truthfully, it's kind of a waste of time to let the two of them just like walk to the door and then we cut to the other side of the door and then they come in. So what I did was I decided to just put the tarot cards right here and we could see Wheel of Fortune, right? And then we could just skip to them just being inside already, right? So in this way, I got to make use of my like recurring thematic element while also avoiding some downtime in the edit that would have just been kind of a waste. Cutting directly from here to the uh, to the interior also would have been really clunky, so we couldn't have done that. The third thing that I did that was kind of notable in the edit here was I definitely had John uh, draw the gun like four or five times. So like first he starts drawing in this shot, and then then he's going to be drawing in the next shot here. So he, he draws, right? Reaction, reaction. He draws again, right? Reaction, reaction. He draws again. Some more tarot cards that uh, draw out the uh, the moment just a bit more. He draws again, right? No! So that was several times, and we we're able to like kind of draw it out. And the the trick is that every time we do some kind of movement, we can actually cut a little back in time before the previous shot ended. And this allows us to definitely lengthen out the, the moment as much as possible and try to build as much towards this climax in which uh, she gets shot. The fourth thing I want to cover is an approach to maybe slow motion that maybe you haven't heard of before. What I did was once Tiffany wins this whole contest and she jumps up, almost all of the shots between there and when she gets shot are shot at 96 frames per second with a 360 degree shutter. So the, the exposure is the full 96th of the second. It's the full frame. What this means is that I could slow it down by 50% using uh, like nearest neighbor uh, frame sampling. So here we can see my retime process is nearest at the project level. And then when I slow clips down, I can slow them down to say halfway. So here's a 50%, so it's running at 48 frames per second. So we've dropped every other frame of this 96 frame per second video. That means that this clip is effectively a 180 degree shutter, right? So we can kind of see that in the movement. It's not too smeary. And then if we want to do something in real time, right? Like at 24 frames per second, if we were to play back video at 24 frames per second, but then have a 196th of a second shutter speed, we would end up with something that looks quite choppy. So I'll show you what that would look like here, right? 
So you can see here the this motion blur is quite small by playing this clip back at like you know the full 24 frames per second. So in full time, it, in full speed, it looks like this. Now let's see it again. So you, you can definitely see that that looks stuttery, right? So here's the trick. If we want to play this clip back at 24 frames per second without it looking stuttery by dropping, you know, three quarters of the frames, what we can do is we can take, you know, if we have four frames, right, we can take frame one and frame two, and we can blend them together, and then we can drop frames three and four, right? So this results in a 48th of a second net exposure from the 96th of a second from frame one and the 96th of a second from frame two. Together, that's a 48th of a second, right? And then for every four frames, we output one frame. So we've got 24 frames per second, and each one now has an adjusted you know, 48th of a second in shutter speed. So here we can see the result, right? Like each frame, previously it looked like this at a 96th of a second. I'll zoom in so you guys can see it here. And then when we kind of blend it with the adjacent frame, rather than just dropping it, we end up with a motion blur that's twice as long. So let's take a look at this fusion composition so we can see how I retimed the clip from 96 frames per second down to 24 and preserved the correct motion blur that we wanted, which was a 1 48th of a second shutter speed. So the first thing we're going to do actually is we're going to, just for fusion purposes, because the fusion composition starts at frame zero, but the, I didn't want to this clip to start at the zeroth frame of the clip. I wanted it to start at, you know, where it was in my edit. So that's gonna be at frame 576. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna to go to linear. We're gonna convert from Zlog2 to linear. Next up, I'm going to scrub over to frame 576. So uh, our fusion composition that starts at frame zero is now gonna be mapped to frame 576 of our media. We're gonna send that through my frame averager fuse. Um, this is available in my GitHub and my utility DCTLs in the fuses folder. Uh, there will be a link to that in the description. The settings here used, we have number of frames. This indicates how many frames are going to be averaged. So we look at the current frame and we're gonna average two frames is what it's saying. In addition, frame hold means that for this frame and the next frame, in this case, the, these two frames, we're going to be using the same image, right? So like we've averaged together two frames and that frame is gonna be persisted for two frames. The next tool here is the periodic frame sampler. So what we're saying here is that we're gonna sample every fourth frame of this result, right? So this is how we go from 96 down to 24 frames per second. And then finally, we go back to our log encoding. So one day I, I plan on making a video that kind of goes more in depth and shows you side by side so that we can see how accurate this is in terms of estimating the motion blur when blending these frames together and whatnot. If you'd be interested in that kind of video, let me know in the comments below. I will admit though that there was one downside to shooting in 96 frames per second, 360 degree shutter for this whole segment. Um, the first downside is simply put that like it takes up far more storage because I was shooting ProRes um, for this whole thing. So it was like four times the frame rate of shooting at 24. However, you know, we did get a lot of slow motion. I knew that much of this was going to be slow motion at the end of the day. The other downside was that I anticipated that I would perhaps want to bring some clips at 48 frames per second, some at 24. And I could like, you know, slice between these and retime them as I wanted and get the motion blur to be 180 degree shutter um, either way, right? However, there were times like during the edit where I felt that 48 frames per second was actually not slow enough. And that forced me to end up using the 96 frame per second uh, clip, like just at its original speed. Yeah, so this was one of those shots. So you could see as he's drawing the gun that there is just like quite a lot of motion blur as a result. And I wanted it to be this kind of slow draw. However, you know, you win some and you lose some. Maybe in an ideal world, I would have shot at, you know, 192 frames per second. Hopefully that didn't bother you guys when you watched it. So yeah, to summarize, you know, we got split frame performances. We got cutting to other stuff in order to bypass an action that would be unnecessary to put in the final edit. You can repeat actions and when you cut forwards, you can like also cut back in time just a half second or something like that. And I think it looks fine. And finally, retiming accurately using this frame averager and the periodic frame sampler uh, fuses that are both available in my GitHub for free right now. This whole premise of shooting at a high frame rate so that we can choose other frame rates to present at, I don't know, I think that's pretty groundbreaking. So let me know what you think. All right, so next up, we're gonna be talking about VFX. So 
most of the VFX in this short were object cleanups, and then there's obviously the, the gunshot, and I'll do a breakdown on how I did the, the gunshot too at the end. But let's go through all these object removals, because the truth is, if you lack production design in the same way that I do, oftentimes these object removals can help polish it up just a little bit and make sure that you have something good. So my prop gun that I use uh, has like this kind of opening in the back in which you can kind of see whether or not it is, uh, it is armed. Now, most real guns do not have this kind of feature. So I wanted to paint it out so that particularly in this shot where it's visible, uh, it wouldn't be a distraction. Painting out an object like this for anyone who's unfamiliar is really just a matter of using the paint node. And then what we do is we simply kind of just like clone stamp around the, uh, the gun and then we just patch it over the little piece that was missing, right? The next step up in object removals was removing light stands that I had left in the background of each shot. So in this example, there was a light stand directly behind Sean. I told Sean to kind of stay there during this line. Um, it's a line in which the waitress is speaking. And I told him to stay reasonably still so that my job would be easier. And also I made sure to put this light stand in front of a very like kind of flat background so it'd be easy to paint out. So for this shot, I did have a trick up my sleeve. So when we shot this, I knew that I was gonna have to remove this light stand because it's touching Sean's head. There's, you know, I can crop down so that this, this little light here is removed, but I can't really like crop this thing out, right? So what I did is I told Sean to duck down and we just shot a quick shot with the light stand moved over here. So that looks like this, right? And now I have this part of the wall that can be easily pasted on above this clip, right? So what I did is I ironed out the motions and stabilized both the background clip and the, uh, the clean plate. And then I aligned them manually. And you can see here, I've kind of like selected this portion of the clean plate and I just smacked that right on top of Sean here, right? Now this clean plate, I can use any part of it, but I'm just gonna like circle out this bit here above Sean's head using this kind of a uh, mask. And then I just take that part of the clean plate and I stamp it in and we're good to go. That's the finished clip. Knowing that I'm gonna crop it down to here, I don't really have to bother cleaning out this light. Here's another one that uh, was a little trickier. It's a similar idea though, right? So we've got this light stand over here and it intersects with John's shoulder, which is in the pink. The whole challenge to this one is that this light stand intersects with this uh, out of focus part of John's shirt, right? So somehow we need to select a uh, half pink thing and half wall, you know, and uh, try to merge that in here, right? So that's, that's the entire challenge. So you can see that this composition gets a little bit more involved. The first thing we're gonna do, as always, is going to be to stabilize the movement of the overall frame. So I got some tracking points. I've been using the Fusion IntelliTrack feature that's new in uh, Resolve 19. And we track the background. We're gonna convert to linear, which is gonna look gross, but you know we'll, we'll come back from linear later. Um, and the first thing we're gonna do is kind of just clone stamp out this whole, uh, the whole light stand, right? So we went from here to a light stand and I've deliberately overshot and I cut all the way into his shoulder here, right? The next thing I've done is I've cut out the solid part of his shoulder, you know, so the part that's not uh, a mixture of the wall and pink, it's just the pink bit. I've blurred it and then we're going to do this trick where we divide by the alpha. So we've got pink of the same intensity, it's edge extended outwards. I'm gonna blur it again, we'll multiply that in and now we have like, We've got this shoulder and now it's like blurred out and we basically have this nice foreground element that we can use right here. So that kind of looks like this, right? So we're gonna take this shoulder piece, we're gonna stack it on top of this plate, right? Boom, so that fills in the gap, right? And then we put the motion back into the shot uh, using the inverse of the tracking that we did earlier. So in the editing stage of this video, I told you about this uh, split screen effect that I was doing in which I have this performance of Sean on from one clip and then I have this performance from Tiffany from a fraction of a second earlier. Right, so here we've got Sean on the left, here we've got Tiffany on the right. You can see that this, here I've simply offset it by 11 frames, it looks like. We're gonna stabilize both clips uh, on the background and align them together and simply uh, chop out, you know, Tiffany here with a nice feathered mask that manages to avoid her very narrowly. And I, I think I keyframed this mask a little bit because she kind of like moves across the line just a touch. So, you know, we've stabilized the two clips and then we mask one on top of the other. Then we put the, uh, the movement, the camera movement back into it. I think I took the camera movement 
must have been from the back plate, the performance of Sean. And then we uh, simply zoom in maybe 1% to fill in the gaps that were coming in on the right edge. Let's see if we can find where those gaps are. Yeah, so you, you can see there's, there's an issue right here, right? So we zoom in just a touch to eliminate that and we're good to go. All right, so here's perhaps one of the most involved shots in this short film is this uh, gunshot that we have where John shoots Tiffany. Let's start off. So here's the back play at the moment of the gunshot. Um, I've got this air pistol over here, so it did shoot out a very small, negligible amount of gas. And then we have a uh, muzzle flare that I rendered out from Blender. So I'll show you what that looks like. So in Blender, what I did is I downloaded this like free like VFX assets pack called F12 Action Cache. And here he's got like these like rendered yellow blobs, right? And you can just kind of position them alongside your footage and uh, just render it out and like kind of play with the uh, the shader. So in this case, I made it a orangish colored uh, 10 strength volume. That was pretty much the extent of my Blender knowledge, right? Uh, my export from Blender is I exported as opening XR and I made it so that the background was transparent. And then when we go over to Resolve, you can see, boom, that's what it looked like pretty much. So it's definitely got some sharp edges here, but not to worry. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to blur it out just a little bit like that. And then we also have the ability to play with the exposure and align it to the background in the right way. Let's take a look. So here we've kind of got it like on top of the background. The trick here was that I, I know that this gun is going to be in the foreground relative to the, uh, relative to the muzzle flare. So I kind of cut out the gun um, as well as the corner of his hand in order to have this stuff on the left be on top of the flare, right? But then I blur the flare so that it, it still bleeds around that like I think it would in real life, especially because this portion of the frame is out of focus. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to do some relighting. So because this flare has light to it, you know, we go from here to a slightly brighter version. I think the flare is going to light up his arm, his hands, his face, maybe a little bit of her, you know, realistically muzzle flares aren't that bright, but in movies they are. So this is uh, really simple. All it is, is it's like I've linear gained it up. So we've got a slight orange color to it that I just found by eye. And then I've drawn like a lot of little polygons everywhere on the hands and the forearms and all these different parts, a little bit on, on her face. And that's just there for one frame. And then we kind of have like a little bit of bloom. So there would be some interaction with the lens. If you saw some bright thing, it would tend to spread out over the, uh, the whole lens. So this here is a simple offset um, in which I've, I've blurred the, uh, this whole lens flare asset like quite a lot, right? I've gained it down so it's very small and I just add that onto the image so you can see you know before after this is in a linear state right now just bear in mind um, next up we're just gonna do it a little bit more again <laughs> so um, here I've bloomed it just a little bit less like a smaller blur and we've kind of added that on so then it interacts with the gun a little bit better here the next thing I've done here is I've got a uh, shell casing, which I've also rendered out from Blender. Um, and we're just going to kind of let it shoot off to the right. And uh, because it's moving very fast, it ends up being quite blurred. So, you know, it, it's barely visible in the shot, but you know, it, it's there, right? So this is the frame after the, the gunshot. You can see like, boom, we kind of add it in. And then if you pay attention closely, in the short, it kind of goes boing and it flies out off that way. You can see in this shot here after the gunshot, um, I've added this bullet wound. So the way I did that is I simply took the, uh, I took the bullet wound from the shot later in the short. Recall it's a bulletproof chicken suit. Um, as clearly described by Alice at the beginning. And I've kind of just sliced it out and I positioned it um, slight blur due, due to the movement. I've tracked Tiffany's jacket uh, costume, grained it up and boom, now it's on there and uh, hopefully tracked on reasonably well. So that's kind of the breakdown of this shot. The subsequent shot that goes after this one is very much the same way. So um, if we skip to right here, I rendered out the muzzle flare from a different camera angle and then I relit the hands and the face. Here you can 
hopefully see that, right? You can see the difference there. Maybe I shouldn't have lit up the arm so much. And then what I did is I also added a little bit of a smoke element. So this smoke actually is just fast noise. And I just like wrote it in here and then like, you know, added it on in linear. Boom, that's the smoke. You know, and then here we have Tiffany falling down. This is retimed using the technique from earlier. Let me show you what it would look like without that, right? So, so you can see this motion blur is much stronger and twice as long as it would be if I had not done this, right? That's the VFX breakdown for this short, mostly object removals. I think everyone should really practice the skills that are in this if, if you want to uh, be the best editor that you can be. And you know what? If you've got gunshots in your short film, make sure you, you know, do some of these things, right? Like make your own muzzle flare asset or, you know, have one that kind of lines up with your goals and make sure you have smoke, make sure you have shell casings, make sure you have you know, the light interaction with everything else, you know, you can't just have this muzzle flare just live on its own because then it's obvious that it's composite. So before I forget, there is one other thing I removed, which was that if you recall from earlier, it was raining at times during this shoot. So I did have to remove raindrops from some of the shots. Now, some of these raindrops were actually just like water that accumulated in the tree. And then sometimes some really fat drops would, would come down, right? So you can see here, let's see, there's a big drop coming in right there. There's another one like right right here, right? So what I did is I went ahead and uh, just clone stamped it out, just painted it out. The um, one trick to painting it out though for, the, for these raindrops was that I can track this background on, I can stabilize according to the background and then I can just clean it out and copy in the background from a few frames before. And that worked out pretty well. What was this? Oh, well. You can see there's a little bit of a drop here that I forgot to clean out. Don't worry about that, guys. I'm not fixing it for the, uh, for the release. So next up, let's talk about music. And music is just such a critical part of making a short film or any other kind of thing in this genre. Truthfully, I was not super happy with how my short was looking without the music. Like, without the music, I was feeling, like, pretty bad. Thanks to the music, I think, I, I think the short actually feels a lot better at this point. So... I'm not really like a great musician or something. I, I did some piano lessons as a kid, but I'm not like anything special about that, right? So let's let's kind of talk about sort of how I approached it. So so I bought like a MIDI keyboard. It's the Arturia Key Labs 49 or something like that, Mark III. Truthfully, setting it up and getting it connected to Reaper, not a great experience, but you know, thanks to the magic of Reddit, I was able to figure it out. Yeah, let's kind of let's kind of go through how this whole thing looks. So we start off here, we've got like a little drum roll that's gonna keep us through this whole eeny, meeny, miny, mo segment, right? Uh, Nitin here didn't, you know, say the eeny, meeny, miny, mo thing super loud. And uh, I just found this drum roll effect, like the online. On the it's a public domain sound, I believe. So at this point, once, uh, once he's made the judgment, I needed some kind of heroic music. Now, I was composing this at the beginning of July, so after thinking a little bit about this triumphant sound that's gonna happen, the obvious choice was to go with the Star Spangled Banner. So, one lovely thing about the Star Spangled Banner is that it's out of copyright. So, you can easily find the some chords or perhaps the melody online, and then what I did was I composed my own chords underneath the melody in order to keep it unique. So. It's kind of got like a little bit more of a sad or uh, ominous kind of vibe to it, um, which was important, particularly because at this point, we're going to transition into John here uh, looking really sad. Oh, this was before I had uh, bought this, the Shutterstock. I had exported a uh, no music, just sound effects and dialogue version of the uh, short for the purpose of composing this stuff to it. It was already in edit lock. And at this point, we go over to John. So John, we've got these flashbacks and I've kind of combined a few different instruments here. Now, where did I get the instruments? I found that there's this, uh, there's a site called like Spitfire Labs where they have a variety of like free instruments that are just available to use. They also have some paid instruments. I've not uh, invested in those yet, but I'm tempted, I'll say. They've got like a variety of different kinds of instruments and I downloaded you know, a whole bunch of their free stuff. And I found the ones that I kind of liked, right? And 
what you're kind of doing is you're like just playing different notes and kind of seeing like if is there anything that inspires you um and sometimes there is sometimes there isn't right as we as we get into the the whole flashback segment we get into these uh cellos and we have like the soft piano kind of thing that's reminiscent of that one song that everyone knows and um we kind of just like fade between the cello and this piano segment you got this there's no way you hear that and for some of these piano chords i ended up making them up myself they weren't in the uh that piano piece i'm sorry sir i just don't see you on the list and then i switched to a different chord because what i needed was a transition chord that allowed us to get into the chord progression that i thought of for this whole shooting i didn't write all the songs in the order that they happen chronologically. It did end up being one of these things where I composed the parts that I was most inspired for first, which I think is probably the way to do it sometimes. This whole segment here is like a variety of instruments and like percussion. So in, in this line, you can see I've got timpani, and then this one here is a, uh, is a kicker from a uh, very affordable like drum sound effects pack we've got cellos the cellos and timpani these all kind of come from the uh, spitfire labs uh bbc orchestra <laughs> instrument set and we've also got like a big bass strings going on there then we're going to move on to like chords with the cello and then this one down here is also a bass uh instrument with the, uh, with the tremolo thing going on too. And then what I did here is I brought in the, the timpani right here, so that kind of like adds a bit more oomph. You can definitely hear it. Ew! Then we can like kind of silence all the instruments at once and uh, let the gunshot ring out a bit more. My gunshot sound has improved since when we, uh, <laughs> since this version of the draft, right? Then here we've got kind of a combination of the bass and the uh, the cello. Initially, we had violins, but uh, I guess I guess I got rid of them. You know. This year I was kind of inspired by that scene in Mad Max Fury Road, where Furiosa discovers that the green place is no longer a thing. They kind of have a long melodic like uh, string segment right there. Uh, in that movie. Bianca. All right. So that's kind of the, the main music segment that we have. Um, for the Star Spangled Banner, real quick, the, uh, it was mostly just a set of horns that were from the, the BBC like orchestra. So for the end of the short, we uh, don't have any dialogue, so I could really go all in on the music. I've got these cellos here that are uh, actually from the Spitfire Audio Amplified Cello Quartet Wobbly. You know, so these were very uh, emotive cellos when I first heard them. And then we've also got the bass line from the um, Spitfire Audio BBC Symphony Orchestra collection. And truthfully, all this ended up being was like thinking of like a few chords and making it so that these chords would last the right amount of time. Right. And then what I did was I kind of built up so you can see like um, and you can kind of see it in the volume too. Right. So. We're going to uh, kind of bring in the bass like a little louder over time so that it builds up a bit. And then I also introduced this like vocal like Oz. These these Oz were from the uh, Spitfire Labs. Like they had, let me see, we can see what it's called. Gaelic Voices Oz, you know. And to me, the, that was the best sounding vocals that they had in there. And kind of what I wanted to indicate with the Oz was like, you know, we have uh, Emily kind of over here. And I wanted it to feel like, you know, this is like some kind of cult, you know, like kind of wanted those like cultish pagan vibes, you know, at the end here. Yeah, so, so I guess there, there are a couple things to think about when doing the music. Now, I... I'm not like doing music a lot on these shorts and you know I did the soundtracks for the last two shorts more or less um, 
first message there i did half of the music and then the other half was stuck and uh, thrifted hoodies i did the whole soundtrack a few things to think about when doing the music in my opinion one is that it's very easy to have like too many sounds and then they all kind of like blend over each other and turn into noise so that's uh that's definitely something to avoid especially if you have dialogue in the same scene you want to ensure that your instruments like carve out a space for that dialogue to exist so that it can be heard right now in this scene over here there's no dialogue so i was very much free to have like these vocals like during the music but if there was dialogue i definitely could not get away with having <laughs> vocals in the soundtrack at the same time because that would clutter those frequencies right and you wouldn't be able to hear anything um the other nice thing is that if you kind of reserve like one instrument for each kind of like frequency band then you don't have to compose as many things right like you only have to think about those small handful of instruments and they go a lot further than if you had like you know done three times as many instruments so a lot of these like i've done octaves and they kind of become like a single sound rather than counting as like two different sounds like sometimes you don't really need to have both cellos and violins doing the same thing at the same time another thought is that throughout this whole project because i was composing my own music i had the ability to kind of choose a consistent set of instruments for the whole thing now you know there's brass on one part you know but then it switches to strings and i guess the rest is all strings but you know there, there's this beauty to being able to just have a unified instrument set because then that kind of creates a sound that feels like it's the identity of the short right so if you've seen my previous short small clown killer we use a lot of different kinds of uh, stock music so as a result like you could make the argument that the sound like the music does not sound unified for the whole thing right but for this i would say that it sounds a lot more unified for the first message it was all piano for thrifted hoodies it was all like the synth kind of kind of noise by sticking to a single kind of instrumentation or a single set of instruments you can really unify the audio and make it feel like a like a single thing right Finally, the, the other thing I'd like to discuss is kind of like choosing stock music or composing your own music. One really nice thing about composing your own music is that you can make it exactly fit your timing. So you're not spending all day like going through different stock music and then saying like, ah, shoot, this one sounds good, but it doesn't cut in right. And then trying to find like AI tools to make it cut together or trying to like manually tweak it yourself. That is, that's just such a frustrating experience and it, it takes forever, right? So, you know, if you have the ability, I do highly recommend <laughs> composing your own music. You can make sure that it's original. You honestly, the composing process, while it's also time consuming, it's not as bad as just like going through and grinding out, like looking for stock music, like looking for stock music is like, it's horrible. I, I, I don't want to do it again. And this was overall a better experience in my book. Yeah, compose your own music, have more fun with it. It's not that hard. All you have to do is think of chords. Thinking of chords is mostly just playing random notes until you find one that pairs well with uh, the previous one or goes in a certain direction. Um, so one thing I've done many times when, when thinking of chords is like, you can find classical music, like old music that's in public domain, and you can lift some chords from there. Um, I've definitely done that like on some of my shorts, you know? But I think one thing that kind of helps is like, I like to grow the chords in opposite directions, right? So what I'll do is I'll have some notes here and then I'll like move some notes up and some notes down, right? And then that kind of like adds breadth to it, right? And then I'll copy some of these notes and I'll, I'll put them on, I'll double them up on the bass line here, right? Maybe move one of them down an octave, these sorts of things, right? You can see here, like these chords up here, they're going up and then the bass line here is going down. So it doesn't kind of feel like you're moving the whole register upwards. It's like you just spread it and then you contract it. I feel like that usually results in a, a more appealing sound. So yeah, compose your own music, stop buying stock music and have fun, you know? Let's hop into color. All right, time to talk about the color grade. So. Here we are back in Resolve and we're on my uh, copy of the timeline so I don't mess anything up. Um, let's talk through this shot here. So we're just going to go from start to end on my node tree and I'll give you some of my thoughts on uh, each individual step. So the first thing we're going to do is we have a noise reduction node. So the noise reduction was particularly useful for these shots that were slow motion. So at 96 uh, frames per second, 
it was hard to get enough exposure into the camera. And also, you know, cameras, when they shoot at a high uh, frame rate, they'll do the sensor readout at a lower bit depth, which means that you're going to have a noisier image. Let's do this shot here. So if, if we zoom in, we can see that we've done our uh, noise reduction and we've got Resolve probably crashing because it's doing a backup. If you zoom in here, like without the noise reduction, we can see that it was, uh, there's quite a bit of color noise. And then for noise reduction, I've simply gone ahead and done a little bit of the temporal uh, chroma noise reduction, the faster setting that I think brought it into a pretty good spot. Truthfully, most of this noise texture is going to be lost on YouTube, but you know, whatever, you can't win them all, right? My camera also had like this dead pixel that I noticed like at the very end of the color grade. So I had to go through with the uh, dead pixel filter. I set this thing to smooth, which seemed to really improve the, uh, the performance. So just draw that around the dead pixel. Boom, gone, right? I had a couple nodes here reserved for dynamic range hacks. So one thing that you can sometimes do if you have a camera like Zcam, which, you know, this is a cool feature of Zcam is that uh, they just take the sensor signals, they gain them, and then they apply a log curve. So as a result, you can definitely just clip only one or two of the channels. You know, you can clip you can clip the channels independently. As a result, like if I were so inclined, sometimes I would be able to uh, reconstruct the other two channels or the other one channel that was clipped. Um, I did not end up having to do that for this short, but I did have to do that for some of my previous ones. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to go to uh, linear and we're going to stay in the camera native color space. Um, I had this node here in case I needed to apply some kind of color correction matrix. Truth is I shot the whole thing on one lens um, with the exception of one shot at the end, which was the close-up of the waves. As a result, I everything was already pretty much color matched quite well. Next up, we have these little segments here. I've used my rebind LGGO tool and uh, this allows me to kind of rebind the wheels on my control surface to different kinds of functionality. So for this one, we've got a, a flare fix. So flare is best modeled by, uh, by offset and linear. Right now we're in a linear image state. So what I would do is I would simply use my lift wheel in this case, which has been rebound to, uh, to offset. It only increases the offset unless you like spin the whole wheel around, right? And that would allow me to fix any color cast that were introduced in the image. Um, let me pull up a clip that actually uses that. Yeah, so as an example, here we've got our flare fix, and I've done a little bit of offset here to, uh, to adjust the black point. In this case, I lifted it up because it was inconsistent with the adjacent shots. And here's one adjustment here that uh, brings it back down. So in total, we've got a, a downwards pointing flare adjustment. The next thing we're going to do now that our flare is corrected at this stage is we're going to use gain for exposure. Notice my loom mix is set to zero. Gain is really simple. If you set it to two, then that goes up one stop. And if you set it to 0.5, that goes down one stop. Four is two stops and so on, right? Um, so we can gain the exposure. And I went ahead and exposure matched a lot of these. Then we've kind of got a balance adjustment. This is again in one of these sandwiches. In retrospect, Balance, I should have just done like just vanilla gain here. I, I didn't need to do what I did here. So what I did here is I took my gain wheel and I rebound it to this max normalized gain, which means that like as you move the gain, the um, the largest one remains fixed, right? So uh, right now here, like if I move the gain like this way, you can see green goes to 1.2. So what I would be doing here is it would take the 1.2 it would divide all three channels of the gain by 1.2. So then this gain adjustment can only make the image uh, darker rather than uh, move it in any other direction. Next up, if I needed to do a contrast adjustment, I had this section here. Um, you should always balance and do exposure and whatnot prior to doing your contrast adjustment. In this case, my contrast adjustment, it's like a gamma adjustment, but it's gained so that mid gray remains fixed. Um, I did not use this very often because most of my contrast comes from the look level, which we'll cover later. Next up, I had this whole series of uh, power windows. So I had many power windows here that were like pre-drawn. I had like one for the middle. I had one for the bottom part of the frame, one for the top. Um, here's a good shot where I used the uh, lower power window, right? So in this one, I took the lower power window and I made the this ground like a little less 
distracting i feel like like it's it's just too bright and i made it look a little more like dead grass so I, I had a handful of curves adjustments that were available to me i ended up not feeling like i needed any of them to be honest and you know you could probably argue that maybe my curves should have been in a in a log state or whatever but moving on after curves we've got these two nodes here so one of them is a field curvature and just upstream of it i have a edge extension the edge extension was used as needed in order to uh, make it so that if I had reframed the image at all, it would extend the edges outwards um, to the edges of the canvas. This timeline is actually a 4096 by 2160, like it's a DCI. And then I just set the output sizing to uh, this more CinemaScope shape. So the field curvature here, this is my free DCTL that kind of blurs the edges. So you can see that. Let's see, can we make it full screen? Yeah. So you can see here we're blurring the edges out. So I've made sure to kind of blur it horizontally. Like it comes in here, but it, it stays a little further from the top and bottom edge. Um, and this blurring, it increases in blur strength as we go further away from the center. Um, much like a lens would if it had a field curvature issue. Next up down here, we've got a series of qualifiers. So here's there's like a pre-qualification node. And this is fed to by the original source so that when you do exposure adjustments, your qualifier doesn't totally break. Each of these qualifiers goes to these secondary nodes and uh, I can do adjustments within these secondary nodes. So as an example, what I did for these shots was I simply qualified luminance above a certain amount, right? And we're just like qualifying based off of the log image at, at the start, right? So I've qualified the highlights here and then I've blurred this, uh, I blurred this brunch here using this blur radius slider, right? And therefore we've qualified the highlights. And then what I did is I just, I just brought down the gain. So without it, it would look a little brighter like this. And I felt that was just like too much, you know? So we dialed that down a little bit and we can kind of see a bit more, um, you know, in that area in, in the background. And it feels less like a hot spot in the frame, you know? All right, next up, we've got a uh, vignetting. So I've separated out the vignette uh, mask, which is like an oval. Let's see, you can see it looks like this here. And I've separated that out from the gain adjustment that the vignetting applies. So in this case, we're going to be bringing down the corners by about one stop. And I basically applied this vignetting just globally across the whole project. All right, next up, let's go into the group level node. So this is essentially the look here. So. We're going to start off by clamping off all the negatives and then I go ahead and do an edge extension. So everything that is all the pixels at the very top and bottom edge of the frame, I extend them downwards. Like I extend them outwards towards the boundaries of the canvas. The canvas is 2160 pixels tall, not a 1714 pixels, which is what we have here. Next up, we've got a, a, a bloom adjustment. Keep in mind, we're still in linear, right? So the way that I did bloom is I, I blur and then I bring down the key output gain. Uh, here's a good shot in which we can test out the bloom. So we can see I kept it pretty subtle. Basically the goal was to take the edge off of um, some of these like kinds of lights. So I've got two stages of bloom. One here is a stronger blur, like a 1.4, and I've set the key output gain very small. And the other one is a uh, less strong blur, and I set the key output gain a little higher. And that way we've kind of got one that like hits the edges and we've got one that kind of like does the overall glow kind of look. Next up, I've got a slight lens distortion in the horizontal direction. So we can see how that looks here. So this lens distortion kind of creates a barrel distortion horizontally. We can see that. And then I go to log. I use node sizing to kind of zoom in a little bit so that we don't have these problems on the edges that you can see like that, right? So we zoom in for this specific amount of edge distortion. Go back to linear because I don't want to be in log for really anything. Next up, I've got Kazi's toolkit. Um, I have it and I've been using it because I wrote it. In here, I start off with the sat control adjustment. So in this case, we've got a slight boost to the uh, kind of like the mid saturations. Um, and that kind of gives us a lot more color in the skin, you know? Next up, I've got a slight adjustment to the, uh, I use a skin compressor, so that's gonna be like a hue versus hue adjustment. And we're gonna take the skin tones and reduce the hue variability in the skin, is the idea. So here we've kind of got the skin compressed thing. And you can see I'm just applying these tools in linear. 
Um, I'm kind of lying to it about what the uh, current color space primaries are. Uh, the effect of that is pretty trivial in this case. So in the case of like the skin compressor, the choice of color space primaries indicates what the default like selected skin hue is. So I just move that to the right a touch. Uh, next up, what's the next node? We got this disabled node, which was uh, something I was playing with. And we've also got this one. Anyway, we're going over here. We got a color compressor. So color compressor is probably one of the better tools in the toolbox. It's pretty unique, I think. Um, and what I've done here is I've selected kind of this blue color and then I've pulled colors that are further from this like blue point. Like if you imagine blue on the vector scope, like it's kind of representing like a color that's around here, right? And in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take things that are generally near, suck them towards that blue, and we leave the other colors untouched. Um, and you can see that because compression far is zero. Compression near, I've compressed the near colors towards it by some amount, and I've kind of controlled where that cutoff is, you know? All right, so next up, uh, we had this, another instance of this hue versus hue adjustment uh, with the skin compressor, where what I'm doing is I am taking the greens I'm kind of pushing them downwards a bit more towards yellow and I'm uh, leveling it off a bit. So then generally our greens will tend to land in this, you know, somewhat like yellow to greenish range rather than going too far into this blue range. Now, sometimes there are just some blue trees and, you know, the color compressor is introducing some blues, some bluishness into these greens, but you know, that's all right. Next up, what I did was I clamped off all the negative values. So the next node here is gonna be the uh, Kazi's tool look DNA. This one I've right clicked and I set the gamma to DaVinci Intermediate. And here I've actually set the transfer function to DaVinci Intermediate. Why have I done that? Well, if you set the d transfer function to linear, then under the hood, we switch it into DaVinci Intermediate. And I trust the resolve transform to be maybe a little faster. Haven't actually tested it. It's entirely possible that this one's actually faster, but you know, whatever. So. Um, ultimately, this tool is just going to draw a 1D curve in uh, DaVinci Intermediate in this case. And here you can kind of see what that curve looks like. So it's a little warmer in the highlights. I've rolled the highlights off pretty low, which is why you see nothing really goes above 80% or so here. Um, so it's pretty creamy. And it's got the, the lightest bit of split tone here. You can see there's just a bit more blue in the shadows, but it's almost nothing, you know? And uh, overall, we can see what the effect looks like. So, you know, here it is without, and here it is with it on. It's a little bit more contrast, a little bluer down there. Next up, we've got a fixed signal to noise ratio uh, noise. So what this is gonna do is it's going to add a little bit of texture here, um, in addition to my photon noise, which comes right afterwards. So the, the combination of the two of these just makes it a little bit noisier over here. You can kind of see that. Um, both are set to monochrome node mode. I mean, you know, probably some of this isn't going to make it across YouTube, but you definitely see that it adds a little bit of texture here and there's no shot. It's going to survive like YouTube. I would recommend if you're watching this thing, I've uploaded it in HDR. So make sure you watch the HDR version of uh, feathers of fortune should look a little bit better. Next thing we're going to do is I'm going to apply a three by three matrix to go from the camera native to DaVinci Wide Gamut. This was just fit based off of some charts. Next up, I'm applying 2499, which is an incredible DRT by Juan Pablo Zambrano. Um, here I'm going from DaVinci Wide Gamut Linear, and I am going to Gamut to 4. Um, one thing that I'm doing here is I've lowered the purity all the way and the density, because if I left these at the default settings, then I find that these reds just go a little bit too far. So we've, uh, we've kind of dialed those down. And then finally, I've got an output blanking. So any pixels uh, will be blacked out that are above or below this region. In this case, it should not do anything. Finally, at the timeline level, we can see what I've got going on here. So the bottom pipeline here, let's get rid of these uh, three nodes over here. This bottom pipeline here, I quantized to 8-bit, and then I have this toggle that switches between um, our SDR output here and the HDR output, which is going to be what you see up here. So the HDR is set up. So first thing we do is we go to P3. So we're, we're from gamma 2.4, and we go to P3 and display linear. So this represents the amount of light that comes off the display. We're going to clamp that off 
to, uh, to be non-negative. This is effectively doing a P3 limiting um, just manually. Next, we're going to apply 2.03 times gain. That represents this checkbox here about the diffuse whiteness in HDR, where the idea is that if you have something SDR and you want to deliver it in like PQ, the recommendation is that you put whites at about 200 nits. Um, in my case, we've actually rolled off the whites pretty substantially down here, so my whites are not going to end up at 203 nits. They're going to end up probably closer to 100 or 120 or something. Next up, we go from P3D65 linear to Rec 2020 uh, SD2084, so that's the PQ curve. Um, so we're basically just directly translating it from SDR to PQ, but with like a 2.03 times gain in the middle, right? The advantage to this, if we're being honest, it should end up being the same image either way. However, the advantage here is that oftentimes with HDR viewing, you aren't allowed to like increase the brightness past the uh, specified number of nits in uh, the PQ encoding. So in order to allow someone in a brighter environment to still enjoy the short, I have baked in that brightness a little bit for them. And then you can reduce the brightness in post if needed, like on the brightness control on your screen. Next up, we're going to use my quantized DCTL to go down to uh, 10 bit um, with the stochastic quantization. This should be perceptually like invisible, if we're being honest. And, uh, you know, it's just to try to combat any kind of banding that there might be. In theory, there shouldn't really be any banding thanks to these two uh, noise nodes that, that should kind of kill it. But, but just in case, it never really hurts. That's pretty much what we're doing here. What I did to make the YouTube deliverable is I turned this off, right? So now we look like this, right? And then I'm going to go over to the deliver page. All right, so here we are in the deliver page and here we've got my uh, most recent HDR deliverable that I'm gonna be bringing to YouTube, right? So here I've selected H265, it's NVIDIA uh, as the encoder because I like using my GPU for that sort of thing. Um, I like to set the resolution to be exactly the image size so that you don't have black bars baked in. This is nice to these users who have an ultra wide display. Frame rate's 24 flat. I'm gonna be using 80,000 kilobits per second because that's quite a few. Um, with H.265, typically like, you know, Ultra HD Blu-rays use somewhere in the range of, I think, 40,000 uh, kilobits per second for those encodings. So this should be pretty safe and good. We're gonna use main 10 because main is just eight bit. So main 10 is 10 bit. Frame reordering. This checkbox once ruined me on a job because some Macs couldn't play it back, but that's not gonna be a problem for us. Preset, I've set this to slow. The choice of preset actually makes a pretty good difference, at least it did in the H.264 days, um, in terms of image quality per bit. Um, we're gonna leave the data levels at auto, and definitely don't retain the sub-black and super white data because that's gonna make your image not broadcast safe. I'm gonna set the color tag to Rec 2020 because those are the primaries, and SD2084 is the gamma tag. And export some subtitles as SRT, right? This needs to be checked, you know. And we're gonna go over to audio. I chose linear PCM. Previously, I tried some exports with AAC, but the scenes with the uh, splashing waves at the end just sounded like absolute garbage. I'm not sure what was up with that on the resolve side, but uh, I don't know, that's definitely a resolve issue. I also checked normalized audio. I've never uh, used this feature before, uh, this kind of export, but I assume it's gonna do something reasonable for us. And yeah, that's pretty much the export settings. After we export, okay, there's some more steps because the reality is that if I were to just upload this file as is to YouTube, we would end up with some serious issues, being that YouTube is gonna convert from HDR here to SDR using their default methodology. But you remember, you know, over at this point, right, we're using uh, a perhaps atypical method to get to HDR, which is that we started with an SDR image and then we just map it directly into HDR. So naturally we want the SDR deliverable, the SDR version that you stream to be the inverse of these nodes here, right? So here's what I'm gonna do. All right, so you can see that I've got a million different little exports here. And what we're gonna do is we're going to recommend to YouTube a specific LUT that we want to use to convert from our HDR file to the SDR file. I'm in Fusion now, 
and I've got a LUT cube creator, and I'm going to specifically set this to 33. This is because YouTube LUTs, like the HDR to SDR LUTs, it's very picky about what kind of LUT it supports. And you have to like stay within certain guidelines. I'm going to make a video about this that goes more in depth sometime in the future that shows what the limitations are. And I've done a lot of experimenting with it this week in order to make sure that, you know, we don't get wrecked and that this LUT actually ends up in the final video. So the, we're going to invert all those steps that I showed you before, right? So we're going to go to P3 linear. We're going to multiply by 1 divided by 2.03. We're going to go from P3 linear to Rec 709 gamma 24. All right, now here's the, the critical step. We are going to clamp to the 0 to 1 range. So I'm going to grab my, uh, my clamp DCTL. I'm going to clamp. So I clamp it from 0 to 1. And this is important because right now, if we're to look at like what this is doing, now keep in mind our image is actually like Rec. 709 limited, so it's not actually going to be using this entire cube uh, later. YouTube is going to look at this and they're going to be like, damn, your black point's fine, but your white's up here and like, you know, you've got crazy, you know, out of bounds colors here, here, and like here, you've got, you know, all this stuff, right? And YouTube's going to look at this LUT and they're going to say, this LUT sucks and we're just going to stick to our default thing. So that's why we need to clamp it down. So we clamp it down, so then YouTube's going to look at the LUT and they're going to say, this is all right. I'm serious. YouTube actually has some kind of hidden quality control step in which they will ignore your LUT if it like goes too far outside the bounds or if it moves the blacks too much or anything like that. So you don't want that, <laughs> you know? So then we're going to go ahead and just like write the, write the new LUT to, uh, to this place. So I'm going to hit save. I'm going to hit yes, write file, right? And now we've got our LUT. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and save this composition. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the metadata tool offered by YouTube in order to insert this uh, LUT into the file. So I demonstrated this a little bit on the thrifted hoodies video, but you know, let's go a little bit more in depth this time. So I'm going to go to windows 64 bit and we're going to be running MKB uh, merge over here. So I'm going to go ahead. I'll use this one. Use your terminal of choice, right? And I'm just going to use this command that I've got here. So, you know, it's not the most nicely parsed, but basically we're going to call MKV merge.exe. I'm going to specify an output directory or like an output file that we're going to be doing. So in this case, I've titled it V3. Copy and paste all of the uh, all of the display arguments that YouTube recommends here. I'll have a link in the description so you can like download this stuff and see where all these arguments come from. And importantly, we're going to have this uh, the LUT attachment section right here. So we've got attachment mime type X cube. And then we've got the, uh, the name of the LUT. Over here, we've got the name of the file that we want to attach the LUT to. So I'm going to take this. We're going to copy. Go over here. Paste. Oh, this is too slow for YouTube. We'll fast forward. All right. So this, uh, the muxing is done, it says. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our uh, HDR upload v3. Where, where the heck is it? There it is. It's down here. And we're going to go ahead and upload that to YouTube. And that's going to be the file you guys have watched right before this. I hope, unless I messed up the, uh, the cube let thing again. Real quick, before we, uh, before we leave, I'd like to have a little discussion about uh, color space for grading. So you could see that in this overall pipeline, I stayed within camera native for basically the whole thing, right? And we just stay in it all the way up until like right before the DRT because you know, 2499 expects DaVinci wide gamut. I can't just choose arbitrary like camera spaces from this thing. So there are pros and cons to this, right? So in the case of my Zcam E2, which is what this thing was shot on, the encoding is done such that we just take the camera native like colors, like straight off the sensor. It applies some white balance to uh, like gain. So literally just RGB gain and linear. And then it's going to do their Z log two encoding. Now Z log two, terrible log curve for being honest, right? But um, that's okay because I don't really grade in logs. So naturally we go straight to linear and we're in linear in the camera, like sensor native primaries, right? Like we're, it's just the colors that's seen by the sensor with some gain adjustments. All of this stuff here then is, uh, you know, gain, right? All of my power windows were just gain essentially, right? Vignetting that's gain 
you know, restricted to certain parts of the image. My highlight recovery thing that I was doing on those shots of Tiffany inside the restaurant, that's also just gain, you know, restricted to, you know, the highlights loosely, right? Areas near the highlights. Um, yeah, and then over here, right, we've got bloom, right? So this represents like a diffusion filter. We've got uh, lens distortion. Well, I guess that's resampling. And in the case of this DCTL, it's like a bilinear sampling. So that that's fine and linear. Um, a little resize, you have to do that in some kind of log space. Um, in this case, I picked DaVinci Intermediate because otherwise resolve, like if you resample that with like Bicubic or one of these other algorithms, you're going to end up with uh, like all sorts of negatives. We're very delicate with this. We have like a sat v sat curve. We have a hue v hue curve. We have like this, this like squishing of colors, like towards, towards blue. We have a hue v hue curve. We have a 1D curve, right? Like just like a RGB versus RGB. We have some noise and then we have 2499, right? Given all of that, right? One of the very useful properties of working in the camera native color space, uh, like the sensor native space, if you had more light coming off of uh, something, then that will result in a higher code value, like an equal or higher code value, right? Off of the sensor. So, you know, if, if for example, there's like this red here, right? I know we can't really see it too well. But let's, let's look at it like this, right? So if we have this red right now and we were to sample it, right? We can see, you know, it, the blue channel is clocking in at maybe 50, 49, 48, something like that, right? Now, even though this thing is red, it's gonna be reflecting some blue light, you know, sometimes you can increase the saturation of that red so much that this blue channel drops and the red channel increases, right? And if the blue channel drops below like whatever we're reading for black, we're reading for black 46, 43, you know, if that blue channel drops below that point, you know, then you've got like a very implausible color. What we're saying is that you have something in that scenario, you'd have something in your image that's black, that's reflecting essentially zero light. And somehow the red thing reflects less blue light than your black thing does. Now that's a problem in my book, right? So to me, I'm very sensitive to these kinds of problems. It happens very often with reds. It happens often with blues and yeah, you can just tell if a color is too saturated if you've like pushed it beyond that point where somehow one of the channels is darker than the black point of the image, right? Or at least the black point in like that local region of the image, you know? Because sometimes you can have a lens flare and that spoils your black point somewhere, but you know. But um, if you grade in a different space, right? Right now I have this guarantee that coming in after this too linear, Every single pixel is like non-negative or it's noise. Like it's just some kind of part of the noise floor that went below zero and is essentially clampable. If we were to transform at this step over to uh, DaVinci wide gamut, there may be certain colors that could end up having negative channels. And then you have to find some way to reel it in and so on, right? Like you end up taking something of a risk right? Because there's a chance that you've messed with the saturations. You've pushed something outside of the gamut. It's hard to keep track of those colors, right? So I intentionally designed this entire pipeline so that I'm working within the camera native colors. And that was something that I think was very computationally convenient. You know, when I'm going to this diffusion step, I'm not worried about blurring negative numbers, right? Um, same with if I use the field curvature, I don't have to worry about blurring negatives. It's just super convenient to know that your exposure adjustment is legit like you're going to be safe i totally recommend it so there you go you guys saw it we went from start to end of this pipeline entirely grading and linear and it can be done so just wanted to throw that out there well at this point the video is probably excessively long and i appreciate those of you who stuck along through the whole thing let me know what kind of content you want to see in the future and in the comments below and uh, until next time, guys, y'all have a good one.